Today we will be talking about Jan van Eyck, who was one of the most significant Renaissance painters during the 15th century. Not much is known about his early life, but according to one source, van Eyck was born before 1390 and died before 1441. He possibly had a sister and two brothers. One of his brothers, Hubert van Eyck, helped Jan complete the Ghent altarpiece. So, did Van Eyck develop something that set him apart from other Renaissance painters? Well, according to Hall in her book Color and Meaning, while in Flanders, Van Eyck utilized the technique of glazing and oil that he had perfected and created miracles of light and transparency that would dazzle the Italian painters and patrons. So, tell me about glazing. Although Jan and his brother did not develop the technique of glazing on oil, the Van Eyck's real achievement was the development of a stable varnish that would dry at a consistent rate. In the simplest terms, glazing consists of applying a transparent layer of paint over another thoroughly dried layer of opaque paint. It allowed the artist to get a variety of shades of one color by using oil rather than black. Van Eyck was able to produce dark colors by laying multiple layers of colors. This painting is the Virgin of the Canon van der Pale, which is an oil painting that has been glazed. Which would you prefer, glazing techniques or no? For me, I believe glazing is the way is a way to bring a painting to life, and it catches the eyes of viewers. Does glazing add or detract from the painting, and why? It looks like the light is reflecting off the painting, and it seems as if the face of the Virgin is illuminated and more alive. Next, we will focus on a work of linear perspective. Filippo Brunelleschi developed linear perspective during the Italian Renaissance. So what is linear perspective? It gives viewers a perspective of a three-dimensional image on a two-dimensional background. Jan van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait is a perfect example of linear perspective. There was a debate of how many vanishing points were present due to varying numbers of orthogonals. The author agreed with Panofsky, who found the Arnolfini portrait had four central vanishing points, and it reflected the idea that individual objects and regions need not be servient to a sense of whole space. The vanishing areas can be distinguished by the areas that are marked H1 through 4. Note the mirror in the background. What kind of perspective does it give us? With the mirror, one can see the depth of the picture and two other people in the painting. The next artist we will be talking about is Andrea Mantegna, who is an Italian Renaissance artist who was born in 1430 and lived until 1506. And Mantegna grew up from humble beginnings. He was the son of a carpenter, but unfortunately he, he was left orphaned at a young age. So what happened to him next? Well, fortunately for him, a contractor by the name of Scorsione adopted him at the age of 10. Now, Scorsione, he owned a shop that was full of antiquities that were all from ancient Rome. For instance, he had many classical sculptures and fragments of stone. And often, humanist thinkers and important people in the day who were interested in Rome, they would fill the shop. And this environment influenced Mantegna in bringing back Roman art. According to Berenson, he said that Mantegna's attitude toward antiquity was romantic. Thus, it was his aim to res resuscitate the ancient world. And he did this through the imitation of the antique. So, what is one of your favorite pieces of art by Mantegna? One of my favorite works by Mantegna is named Camera Digli Sposi, which is the most famous frescoed room in the Ducal Palace. And this palace belonged to the Gonzaga family of Mantua, who had appointed Mantegna as a court artist in 1460. So Mantegna worked on this room from 1465 to 1475, and he portrayed the members of the Gonzaga family and he really created an illusionistic space. How did he create an illusionistic space? Well, specifically in the meeting scene, which is on the one of the walls of the room, he is able to use aerial perspective 
in which objects that are closer to us appear blue in color while farther away objects appear lighter. And you can specifically see this in, in the distance, uh, in the clouds and in the mountains. It seems very natural and realistic. It also seems as if we are in the crowd and are able to hear them talking. So, what other techniques did Mantegna use in his artwork? Another technique used by Mantegna was foreshortening, which refers to a method of representing an object in a picture in depth. And this is seen specifically in the ceiling where you have an oculus. And this oculus, in a way, imitates uh, the Pantheon, which was built during in the time of ancient Rome, where the dome had an oculus in the center. And here you see foreshortening in the Puti, who are naked angels whose feet are closer to us, um, and they look larger, while their heads are smaller because they are farther away from us. It seems that there are many figures above, including the Puti, that display foreshortening, like the birds and other spectators. It suggests that there's a three-dimensionality and volume in the figures. This leads to a noticeable increase in realism. Along with his ability to explore the boundary between image and reality, Mantegna also shows his sense of humor. Because as you can see, there is a pot precariously perched over the edge of the opening, as if it could fall any minute on observers. According to Sherd, she wrote that Mantegna's contemporaries applauded his ability to reconstruct a scene from Roman life as, it was, as if it was from life, and of the depth of his archaeological knowledge from which lifelike reconstructions could be built without constraining him to obey canon of archaeological correctness. Thank you.